Lee Hamilton. I'm the president of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and it's my very distinct pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon to a very critical discussion on the topics raised by Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wu Dunn and their important new book. I see a good many of you have it already. Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide. That book has uh, just been published. Today's discussion is co-sponsored by International Gateway. That's the trade office of the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center. The Gateway works with groups drawn from the public and private sector to host events, including this one, in this award-winning facility. I'm very grateful to the Wright Ribbon Alliance for their extraordinary work and, of course, helping make this event possible. It's a pleasure to have the authors here, of course, but it's also a pleasure to have Aparjita Gugoy and Jeremy Zugrana. I told them not to hold me too closely on pronunciation here. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, they are two very remarkable individuals who really have made a difference on the ground, doing inspirational work and directly advancing women's quality of life and human rights. Their efforts, alongside many others, truly remarkable men and women, are chronicled in the book, Half the Sky. I want to take this opportunity also to thank two people from the Wilson Center, Gib Clark, who is the coordinator of the Global Health Initiative at the Wilson Center, Jeff DeBelco, who directs the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. They do outstanding work, and this program is one evidence of that. Nick and Cheryl wrote in a recent issue of the New York Times Magazine, and I quote, if the injustices that women in poor countries suffer are of paramount importance, in an economic and geopolitical sense, the opportunity they represent is even greater. I'd like to think that that notion underpins much of the work that Jeff and Gibb and many of you do. Nicholas Kritoff and Cheryl Houdon are well known to all who care about and who follow human rights issues over the past couple of decades. Each has had a truly distinguished record as journalists. At the New York Times, they shared a Pulitzer Prize for their coverage of China during the Tiananmen Square democracy movement. Since becoming a Times columnist in 2001, Nick says he became a columnist because of the events of 9-11 and the greatly increased interest in foreign affairs because of that event. He has emerged as a gifted chronicler of individuals whose stories usually don't make it into the headlines. His work focuses on the human face of the 21st century's global challenges uh, in far too many places for me to list. He won a second Pulitzer for his work as a columnist in 2006 a graduate of Harvard and Oxford, a native of the state of Oregon. Cheryl is a leading authority on East Asia, having served in the Times Tokyo Bureau in addition to her work in Beijing. She's worked at Goldman Sachs and currently serves on the board of her alma mater, at Cornell University. She's a graduate of Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Nick and Cheryl, as you know, are married. They have three children. Half the Sky is the third book they have authored jointly, following the remarkable success of two other books, China Wakes and Thunder from the East. Aparjita Gokoy is the national coordinator of White Ribbon Alliance India and country director for Sidpa. And Jeremy Zungana is the national advisor to White Ribbon Alliance in Burkina Faso and Rwanda and country director for Jupaiko in Rwanda. They will discuss their work to improve women's health 
starting with a healthy pregnancy and safe childbirth. Their perspectives, I know, will greatly enrich the discussion of this afternoon. It is now my very great pleasure to turn things over to the director of the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program, uh, Dr. Jeff Gabelko. Jeff. Thank you very much, Lee, and uh, thank you all of you who come out and here, uh, I know what promises to be a, a, a terrific discussion of some issues that frankly are neglected, as Lee pointed out. These are issues that don't always get uh, the headlines, um, despite the very best efforts from our, our colleagues here. Uh, and so it's terrific that we have this wonderful book, Half the Sky, uh, coming out just this week. So you really are getting one of the first opportunities to take a look at it and hear from our authors and hear from some of the folks who are really on the front lines of this. So I want to thank again uh, the White Ribbon Alliance and the International Gateway for helping make this possible. It's a real thrill for us at the Wilson Center to be hosting this, and we had to move from our, our um, location in the building to this larger one to accommodate the, the tremendous interest in this topic. But our Global Health Initiative has tried to find some of these issues that are not getting as much attention as they should. So maternal health is one. Health in post-conflict settings is another. Uh, health financing. And so it's, it's terrific that we can um, really have this, what I would consider a, a capstone, a pinnacle event in bringing attention to maternal health. And our Environmental Change and Security Program has had a long and very productive relationship with uh, the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID. It makes a lot of our programs possible. So it's terrific as much as the family planning and reproductive health questions were front and center in, in the discussions on the book. So I'd like to turn first to, to Nick and to Cheryl, and I guess I turn both directions here. But um, Easy to, questions to me, hard questions okay, to Cheryl. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give her the first <laughs> softball, and then you can. Um, I, the, the report, or the book, excuse me, is rich in, in citing reports and statistics, and the stuff that many of these practitioners and policymakers in the audience here uh, consume on a, on a daily basis. But the two of you really used um, the stories of women uh, who have, who have suffered and who have overcome to, to bring these issues forward. Can you talk about some of those women and the lessons that they can teach us, and then how you see those being best connected back to those many times faceless numbers and reports that we deal with so often here in Washington? Well, we really actually try to blend uh, the uh, importance of statistics uh, and research with the reality of what's on the ground. And so we uh, saw uh, women who had been through so much. Their stories were just so compelling to us that we just could not not share them with, with readers. Uh, and so we talk about um, women who have been raped. Uh, you know, some of this is extremely hard to, uh, to, to stomach. I mean, you, you, you both know what, uh, uh, you know what it's like on the ground. Um, we talk about women who have uh, died needlessly early in childbirth uh, because they didn't have access to health care, issues that you know, you know very, very well from research. Um, but uh, we also talk about how uh, they actually, some of them have survived. Um, one of the people that uh, you know, we really uh, were, were moved by uh, was uh, Mahabuba. Uh, she uh, is um, in Ethiopia. Uh, at the time of, you know, the event that happened to her, I mean, she uh, in, had a terrible uh, situation. She was raped um, when she was something like, you know, 13, uh, and uh, she ended up having the baby on her own. I mean, no one was there to help her because she was abandoned um, by her family, and she obviously, you know, was so young that, you know, in the end, she actually had obstruction in labor, and the baby died. Uh, and she suffered um, an injury, an internal injury, called a, an obstetric fistula, uh, which is a terrible uh, you know, injury that leaves a woman incontinent, uh, as well as you know, almost incapacity, un unable to move. Uh, and so um, a villi she would, villagers basically, you know, when you're incontinent, obviously she ended up you know, not being able to control herself, and so she was very smelly, and no one wanted to be near her. So, they put her in a hut at the edge of a village, uh, and they ripped off the door so that the hyenas would get to her. So uh, in the middle of the night, she was grasping a stick. She took that stick, and she fought off hyenas with that stick. This girl was only 14. 
The next day, she crawled to a nearby village where she knew there was a missionary, uh, a Western missionary, who you know, took her in and then got her to a clinic and to a hospital where she was actually operated on. These, these fistulas can be operated on if you get access to health care. And he actually was able to basically save her. Uh, the hospital saved her. And now she's a, um, she's a wonderful woman who is, is actually now a nurse at that hospital. So she's a fully productive asset. I mean, uh, these are the stories that we talk about in Half the Sky. And they support um, all of the, I mean, you know, so they, they're really sort of the face of all those statistics that, uh, that we, all, we read about. I think one of the larger problems, actually, which we try to address is that, um, in general, I think the humanitarian community, whether it's the UN or NGOs or journalists, we haven't done a great job in calling attention to humanitarian issues, partly because we believe in them so much. And as a result, I think we're often not as effective as we should be in getting non-believers to pay attention to them. And it always sort of disturbs me that if a company is introducing some product that doesn't matter at all, if it's introducing a new brand of toothpaste, then so much energy goes into marketing this toothpaste to try to get people to buy it. Well, when there are millions of lives at stake, then very little creativity or thought goes into the marketing and message of, of that uh, issue. And I think that's one reason why, for example, maternal mortality has been on the agenda now for several decades and yet has made remarkably little progress. And over the last 20 years in, in, in Africa, for example, the number of women dying in pregnancy or childbirth has actually increased. Um, and globally, it's been pretty much stagnant for the last 25 years. Um, and there has, in fact, been some interesting work in the field of social psychology about precisely this issue, about what builds empathy and gets people to care. And uh, one of the, uh, we briefly talked about some of the lessons of that. Let me just briefly explain it, because I think it informs kind of our, our thought on this. One of the things is we know intellectually that people don't really care about a group. They care about an individual. But you know, we've never really thought about how big the group is before people begin to get turned off. It turns out that it's when the, the group gets to be uh, simply two people that if you ask people to donate and there's one victim, if you will, one individual, then they will empathize with that individual. They will try to help. The moment you have two people and they become a class, then empathy drops and support efforts to, to help them drops. In addition, um, there is quite a bit of evidence that people want to be a part of something successful. So they're much more willing to uh, help save, uh, for example, 50 lives out of 100 than they are to save 500 lives out of 100,000, even though it's much less cost effective. And you know, the kind of messaging the humanitarian community tends to do are first, there are a million people suffering from such and such, and uh, that you know, we present it on a cosmic scale that you're going to save so many lives, but it doesn't seem so, so, so great. And I think as a result, a lot of our messaging on these issues doesn't connect. And I think it's one reason why a lot of these issues haven't gotten more traction uh, over time. Um, uh, and that's one reason why uh, Half the Sky is uh, chock-a-block with stories uh, you know, and the whole panoply of areas to try to build that connection and then, and then talk about them at a more uh, intellectual level and bar from studies and so on, but to try first to build a emotional connection uh, with the issue. We'll see whether it works. Yeah, well, let me follow up on that form of communication on this and, and reporting. Um, you both obviously are, uh, well, you've received the kind of pinnacle award for your profession in journalism, the Pulitzer Prize. Um, how does the book in that format what does that allow you to do that, say, your column or your reporting um, doesn't necessarily do? And, and then perhaps also, Cheryl, I noticed that some of what you're doing is, is really trying to also go forward with a, a, a kind of a social market, not necessarily social marketing, but the kind of some of the variety of online mechanisms to plug into different audiences and communicate on this. Can you talk about how the form of this is um, part of how, your, your hopes for how to reach some of these audiences? Well, my column in the New York Times is about 790 words. And, you know, so twice a week I turn out that many. And 
you know, you're counting every last word trying to you know, use uh, uh, can't instead of cannot to save two characters here and there. And I mean, the truth is that all these issues are interconnected. And that if you're writing about maternal health, for example, which is so much of a, a topic today, then it's hard to talk about that in isolation uh, and not mention uh, girls' education, for example. Um, and all these issues, because they are interconnected, it felt to us that it was very important to try to approach this in a more integrated um, fashion and to be able to tell stories, but also, um, you know, borrow from some really important academic research. And, and the, the field of development, I think, has become much more rigorous in recent years. And has a, there are a lot of insights that, uh, that we can borrow from. So, um, you know, for somebody who's used to writing 790 words, it is such a treat to be able to inflict a book on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but the other reason is that we also know that everybody has their own personal experiences and back, different backgrounds and different things move, you know, different people. And so when you have a variety of things in a book like that, although they're all in interconnected, something will speak to someone. And so, you know, we just hope that people will pick up on the strand or the, the, the path that really speaks to them. So you, you, let me pick up on one of Nick's points and, and toss it to Aparajita and, and to Jeremy, which is, um, why is it that we've seen so very little progress on maternal health in, in the MDG5? Because as Nick cited, that we've, there, there, has been, there have been some efforts, um, obviously not enough. But that's one of the ones that where there hasn't been movement and, and some backsliding. So from your perspectives and working in the field, what is it that you see are the real barriers that we need to, to overcome? Okay. You know, first of all, uh, maternal health is such an issue that there is no solution, no one size fits all. There are localized problems, and you have to implement localized solutions. There's no magic bullet. However, we know what can prevent women and children from dying needlessly. What we are not doing is actually implementing those solutions. And the, and the reason for this is different in different countries. Some countries are in conflict. In some countries, there is no political will at all. Maternal mortality or women's health do not feature in the political agenda. So there are so many, many reasons. In countries like mine, in some communities, women's life is not just worth saving. You know, families would watch and stand and look at a woman undergoing labor for 28 hours, 29 hours, bleed to death, watch life web out of her, but just not take the decision of taking her to a health facility where her life can be saved. So there is a multitude of reasons why maternal mortality has literally remained where it is. I mean, there are islands of excellence. There are many countries which has really done well, and I think the world needs to look at what has worked in similar situations and really implement that in their own countries. Mm -hmm. And in the Indian context, what are the, some of the things that have, have been successful that you would want to highlight, particularly to an audience that is in the, the business of, of, of working on these kinds of programs? You know, women are dying not, not just because they don't have access to health facilities. It's also because of a lot of societal causes. Status of women in society, lack of education, lack of women's decision-making power. 50% women in my country cannot even make a decision that she should go to the market to buy, you know, go shopping. She has to take someone's permission. She obviously has no right to take decisions over how many children she should have, when should she have children, where should she, should she have children, does she want to have children at all one after another. So, you know, so it has to come from within countries. It has to come from within societies. When we talk of empowering women, we cannot just look at the women and forget her society. Re reaching that woman is like reaching the core of the onion. You have to peel away layers of communities, of families, of religious beliefs, of traditions, and only then can you get to it. And that's the reason why we advocate that when you look at a problem like girls' education or maternal mortality or reproductive rights, you really have to take a holistic view. Jeremy, how about in, in, in your Rwanda, Burkina Faso, obviously, but uh, other places where you're working, what do you see as the big impediments for why we haven't made more progress? I think the problem, we have to see it as a holistic uh, problem because uh, 
when we talk about maternal mortality, we, it's not about having access to quality of services, but we, the, the big problem is access, but at which level? If we have the, the women who have problem and can't have the decision to first to know that there is a problem, and when these women decide to go at the health service facility, they don't have transportation system in place. And when these women reach the health system, and at this level there is no uh, skill provider, and there is no equipment, there is uh, many barriers, this, the bad thing will happen. So for me, most of the time we focus on the decision making, the policy, but we forget one part to make the quality of services ready. And when the quality of services are ready, we are not sure, we are not ensuring that we are increasing the demand based on the social reality at the country level. So we have to consider all aspects and not focus only on one intervention. I think this is the problem. And if I have to consider the case of Burkina Faso, I, I can say that women don't have access to health services because they are not available in terms of number, in terms of quality. And women also don't know that they need this kind of services. We have a traditional uh, norm that don't allow women to go at the health facility. We have also the economical barrier. We know that when we talk poverty, we talk about women. So all, all these kind of things are linked. In addition to that, when you analyze the budget of the, 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 the health in our Ministry of Health, we, we, you will realize that it's less than 15%. And this is far from the need. The same thing for all, all country in Africa, I can say. So this is the kind of thing. And, and one thing that I have to, to say is the international context. Now when we have a meeting to talk about health issue, we are talking about only one disease and we forget all the rest. You know, you, I don't want to talk about this disease, but only one disease. And when you analyze a lot of programs, you see the budget, more than 50% of this budget go to this program. And what about maternal mortality? You have to say, okay, if we finish to resolve this problem, we'll talk about maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. And I think this is uh, uh, one of the reasons. If not, we can talk and talk and find more. <laughs> I think there's actually one lesson, perhaps, from America's own experience about why we haven't gotten more traction in maternal mortality. If you look at the history of American uh, health and public health, then throughout the 19th century, we made incredible strides economically in education, and including girls' education, for example, and yet maternal mortality rates in the U.S. showed remarkably little progress. And then, uh, in, in, indeed, in, in World War I, uh, one of the, to me, most shocking statistics is that more women actually died in child, more American women during World War I actually died in childbirth than American men died at war. And yet, it's just something we, you know, it was always happening. And then, uh, finally, what actually made a difference, you know, wasn't just the generally rising economy, it wasn't rising education standards, it wasn't more urbanization as such, although probably all those helped a little bit. But when women got the right to vote, then you began to see some quite remarkable strides in uh, reducing maternal mortality. And it wasn't exactly so simple as, okay, women get the right to vote and all of a sudden you know, they're passing new measures. But it does seem to be some broader sense that women become more valued members of the community, uh, more respected, uh, as well as a sense among politicians that women wanted more public spending on health care. And some combination of those factors uh, seem to be the main reason why in the US we were able, after a long stagnation, to actually reduce uh, maternal mortality rates here in the US. I mean, you, you've, you've all touched on the fact that the kind of critical shortfall in the availability of services, but said at the same time that's necessary but not sufficient to get there. And so a lot of the comments and of course many of the themes of the book are rooted in this notion of the power disparities and the fact that the, the, the women are, 
are challenged in so many of these contexts to have voice, to have decision-making power. So from, from the, the stories that you have, you have told and the experiences that you have uh, working in the field, what, what are the, the models or maybe a particularly inspiring story that suggests the ways that we start to break those links? Because you, you stress the importance of um, the women being part of the solution or driving the solutions. Um, so where do you see these success stories that we can build from and draw lessons from? I mean, well, one of the areas that I have you know, seen that really has um, come a long way is in China. Uh, you know, my grandmother's feet were bound. So three generations ago, look where women were in China. Uh, a lot of women had their feet bound. Uh, and now, uh, you know, partly because uh, Chinese women were allowed to be educated. I mean, basically, China said everybody can be educated, including girls. In other words, they <laughs> didn't prevent girls from going to school. They welcomed them to go to school along with boys. But while that is necessary, it is not sufficient. Uh, because the other important thing is that uh, a society has to allow women to work, to be absorbed into the labor force. And so the women in my ancestral village, they were educated, but then they were also allowed to leave their village to go to the county seat to go work in factories. Now we may call them sweatshops. Uh, and believe me, I think they're terrible places to work. I wouldn't want my kids to work there. Um, but when a woman is faced with the decision, do I spend my life in the rice fields, in the rice paddies, um, or you know, where I'm not really as strong as the men, or do I work in a factory you know, where Americans call them sweatshops, welcome the factory. It's because they earn an income, which they weren't doing in the, in the rice paddies, and they send that income back to their families in, in, at home in the village, their status just goes way up because they're a breadwinner in the family. And that's the beginning of you know, changing dy dynamics of the relationship between men and, and women. And so the clothes we wear now, the shoes we wear, the bags we carry, uh, a lot of them are made by Chinese women in factories. That, those women help jumpstart the Chinese economy. Now, across uh, Asia, that, that, that happened as well. And it's, you know, it, it, it may, if one can sort of replicate that in other places of the world, that's great. And it's not going to be exactly the same. Each country will find their own way of, of doing something like that. But the key is empowering women and bringing them into the workforce. I just want to carry on from where you left off and talk about maybe what we can call social empowerment. You talked about economic empowerment. You know, if you look at the issue that we all are, uh, you know, working on, which is maternal mortality or lack of access to better healthcare services, who are the women who are being affected? It's definitely not women in this room. It's not me. It's not you. It's women who are poor, who are not educated, who do not have decision-making power. And I think when we talk of you know, looking at the light at the end of the tunnel, we have to realize that these are the women that we have to reach out to. And I want to give you an example. You know, we organize public hearings in India where we tell women just to come and talk about their experiences, what they faced when they went to deliver in a health facility, or what went through her mind when she was lying in labor, waiting for her husband to come back from work and take a decision whether to take her to a hospital or not. And we organize public hearings where we bring in government uh, officers, we bring in policy makers, ministers, you know, members of parliament. We bring in health service providers and we create a very safe space where the women can talk in a very non-threatening atmosphere. It's not always non-threatening, but we try. When we went and told the women that, you know, come and talk about what you have experienced, good, bad, ugly, the women first laughed and giggled and said, what makes you think anyone is interested in knowing about my experiences? Which was really, really surprising for us. They said, why should I talk? Why? Nobody cares. Nobody cares whether I die, I survive, or what? And it took us a lot of 
information dissemination when we talk to women about you know you, your right to health there are policies there are programs under which you are entitled to certain things if you go to a hospital for a delivery you're not supposed to pay for your drugs or the procedures is supposed is provided free by the government and finally when the women came and spoke i mean that was very very moving not for us because you know we we work with them and somehow you know we are so attuned to all this but for the policy makers it was a thousand time more effective than people like us going and talking to the policy makers or the government officials because they came and spoke about some very good experiences where a health worker went out of their way to help someone or experiences where they watched their neighbor or their sister just die you know being rushed from one hospital to another ambulance being there but no fuel and i think what we try to do is we really try to get the stories out from the people who are affected because we feel that that's the very honest way of uh, conveying the re the real issue okay. Okay. am i allowed to ask a question uh, <laughs> certainly you wouldn't be a journalist <laughs> if you didn't right uh, i'm curious um because um I mean, you guys, uh, Paradita and Jeremy, you guys are in the field, and one of the things that strikes me as a impediment, and I've seen this maybe more in Africa, but um, over and over, and most recently in Sierra Leone, which is the highest maternal mortality ra ratio in the world, um, the uh, you know interviewing women, and they don't want to go to the clinics or hospitals. They want to go to the TBA, to the traditional birth attendant. And you go and see the traditional birth attendant, yeah. and you, you know, you shudder. I mean, somebody who's completely uneducated, has learned things from her mother, doesn't really know what she's doing, yeah. uh, kills women right and left. And they, and it, as far as I could tell, it was basically that the TBA might not know what she was doing, might be utterly incompetent, but had a great bedside manner. And the doctors, in contrast, were rude, they were arrogant, they often humiliated the women, they didn't, there was no market reason, for them. they were just overwhelmed, and so the women responded quite naturally by staying away from the hospitals that might save their lives and going to the TBAs, which were killing them. Now is that, is there some truth to that generally, and do you see that, and how does one get around that? Yes, yeah, this, this is true because uh, TBA are uh, first women from the village, usually the elf Elf provide uh, someone who come from another country, so it's not sh clear sure that we know the culture of this country. You can also send a young uh, young lady who is midwife to deliver all dead than her. So this kind of thing, you are right. But what we are doing, and I uh, just want to share some success uh, story about what we are doing at the field. With, uh, with the White Tribune Alliance, we, we try to, to link the community, from the community to the decision maker with what we are doing. And the good example is when we have uh, the, some uh, elf, elf area, catchment area to train provider, for example, uh, one of our programs with Gapaigo at the field is really to make sure that provider are skilled. And uh, I have to thank uh, U.S. aid for that because it's through the program that we are able to bring the technology that we have from university here at the field level. So when you train provider, you have to add this cultural part to make sure that they are able to be competitive as TBA, traditional birth attendant, to be able to welcome well people, to let the woman decide what kind of position she wants to use for delivery because uh, in traditional, traditionally, they allow women to use the, the, the cures, etc. So, in addition to that, we have to to educate even the high profile level. Because when you talk about maternal mortality, you say, "Do you know that every three hours in my country, women die?" The first lady will tell you, "Really? I never know that." She is counting how many we have in the budget how many roads we have at the country, but how many women die, this is not a problem. Mm -hmm. So we try to have this kind of link, give the floor to the women to talk about the issue, and also along the first lady and star, rock star, everybody to talk about this issue, and together they know the standard, the quality to do, and everyone can follow now what happened. And 
we have uh, many kind of success that uh, the White Tribune Alliance have been able to do uh, in the world with uh, government, with partner, to build a very strong system that ensure that the quality of services are here. Quality in terms of technically, but also in terms of satisfaction of client. Mm -hmm. So with, with a, a couple, I think, excellent examples of how to respond to this challenge of, uh, of, of the power disparities, um, are there, are there, I'd like to ask you about what you've seen in terms of this kind of integrated picture that you've given us, both in terms of problem, but then also on the solution side. And one of, the, one of the challenges, clearly, uh, that we can all recognize, and many of these people face day to day from the, from the say, the donor side or developed country trying to help um, assist on these issues, is the notion of the stovepipes and the bureaucracies and the funding sources that go for one but not for the other. And Jeremy alluded to this in terms of lots of attention for one disease but forgetting others and, and, and such the implications of that. From, from, from the research and the reporting you've done for the book, have, have, you, have you run into this problem in the field? Uh, and then what are your reflections and since we're sitting in the building that literally houses U.S. Agency for National Development, for example, uh, about uh, the challenge of uh, doing single sector in a multi-sectoral world where we live truly integrated lives? I mean, well, there are certainly certain things about maternal mortality that are isolated. I mean, that really you need to focus. You need specialists and you mm -hmm. need, you know, someone who knows how to deliver a baby, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is different from what you would need, you know, to combat sex trafficking where you need policemen to sort of crack down on brothels. Um, so to some degree there is uh, separation, but in reality there's also a lot of necessary integration because ultimately it comes down to the status of women. Uh, and women's rights. I mean, they're just the right to speak up. And, and you know, as uh, Parajita and Jeremy have said, I mean, just the right to say, I want to be able to deliver at a health clinic. Uh, you know, it's, it's really uh, giving the woman the confidence uh, in certain, some, in some of these places to be able to, uh, you know, ask for just basic needs. And so I guess in terms of integration, I mean, it, it, you know, you know, our lot, you know, a woman's life is not sort of compart mentalized, maybe it's serial. I mean, you know, when she's, uh, you know, in her childbearing years, she'll, you know, be demanding certain things. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's when you step up on the maternal health. But, uh, it, you know, there's also the idea that, you know, a lot of things are very integrated. And, you know, overall, you just need policies that will support women's rights. Yeah, I mean, the Jeremy was absolutely right here. I mean, he was diplomatic earlier when he talked about the disease, but I mean, there's a great deal of frustration about the way so many resources have gone to HIV and AIDS, and often the upshot has been that you get very talented health workers who leave positions where they're actually dealing with people and are hired by NGOs to be administrators and are sort of taken out of the, of the front lines. Uh, and so sometimes spending actually undermines uh, other areas. And maternal mortality, uh, I think, in some ways has been a loser uh, from um, uh, a focus uh, on AIDS in particular. And that's why most recently, when PEPFAR was renewed, there was indeed an effort to create a broader uh, 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 systemic approach, and I think that was that was absolutely right. Um, and at, if you look at the places where there have been successes, whether they be China, as Cheryl alluded earlier, uh, Sierra Leone has, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Sri Lanka has managed to reduce maternal mortality by about 90 percent since the 1930s, uh, quite steadily. Um, uh, and Kerala in India has, has also, the numbers are a little fuzzier, but it, it's made great progress in maternal mortality as well. And there, it does also seem to be a real systemic approach that does include educating girls, valuing them more broadly, looking after reproductive health uh, in general. I mean, one part of reducing maternal mortality is also uh, improving family planning so that people are actually having fewer uh, births as well. So if you, just the stove prepping approach, um, you know, it really can get in the way of making progress on this issue, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you mentioned family planning, which is, uh, uh, has a chapter devoted to it, and one of the solutions that uh, 
cost effective and par part of the solution in this kind of integrated approach. You, you uh, introduced the term, at least a new term to me, uh, in terms of talking about the God Gulf. And this is, in some ways, we're still focused on the politics here rather than the politics overseas. Do you want to talk about what that is and how you see bridging it as uh, critical to really being as supportive as we could and should be on these issues? One of the, um, we look at examples in the past uh, where there really have been successes and it, it seems to us that we're really going to make progress on issues like women's rights globally, not so much just by passing laws from above and not just by recruiting presidents and prime ministers, but by really having a broad grassroots social movement and changes the priorities and when people lead, politicians will follow. Um, and maybe the best example of that was the British uh, abolitionist movement in the 1780s, which is an extraordinary story. In 1780, uh, essentially, slavery wasn't even on the agenda. There were a few Quakers who were jumping up and down about it. Nobody else paid any attention. By the late 1780s, you had more people in Britain who had signed a petition against slavery against, before ending the slave trade then were entitled to vote at that time. You had millions of people who were boycotting sugar, uh, and eventually it led to the abolition of uh, slavery in areas controlled by, uh, by Britain and laid the groundwork for the end of the transatlantic slave trade. And Britain paid cost, lost an average of 1.6 percentage points of GNP for 60 years, lost 5,000 troops uh, because of that. It was a real commitment. And, one of the reasons why it succeeded, I think, was that it encompassed both uh, sort of quasi-Jacobins on the left, people who were real, real leftists, uh, and evangelicals on the right. Um, and it, w it managed to really be an extraordinary coalition. In this country, that is something that is enormously lacking from this area. If you look at sex trafficking, there are a lot of liberal feminists who are very active on this, have done great work on it. There are a lot of evangelical conservatives who have done great work on this area and have pushed it. There is such distrust in America right now that there's very little cooperation between the two sides. And because there are some areas of disagreement, uh, then there isn't cooperation on what everybody agrees on, which is that you know, the 15-year-old girl shouldn't be locked up in brothels. And that God Gulf, this real disagreement between and distrust between uh, more secular, uh, more liberal people on the coasts and uh, uh, evangelical Christians, you know, more in the center, has uh, I think has really hobbled our ability to make more progress on sex trafficking and on uh, well on maternal mortality, which um, you know, and obviously this is a it's. It's difficult. I mean, there, there are obviously going to be disagreements about abortion, all kinds of things. Um, but I think that there, uh, that if one's going to register progress, there has to be greater effort to try to get all sides uh, in the room and working on areas of common agreement. I mean, they really should borrow from the corporate world and form strategic alliances <laughs> just around a certain area, but they can have their own, uh, you know, uh, areas of separation. Okay. Terrific. Well. We have a, a very expert audience and very large audience, so we should give them a, a shot. I've had my opportunity to ask you some a questions. Shot may not be the right word. I, okay, that's right. <laughs> An opportunity to pose some challenging questions to our panelists on a fascinating topic. So uh, we are recording the meeting, so I'm going to ask for you to wait for one of my colleagues to bring your microphone. If you could let us know who you are and pose your question in a tight, concise fashion and um, uh, then that would be wonderful. So I think I saw a hand over here. Kaylee, was there one? Yes, right there. Yeah, I would like to know. First, oh, okay, thank if, you. If you First could... and foremost, thank you for writing that article. I, I, you sparked a domino effect in the media. Like uh, yesterday, I saw a Washington Times front page, Congo, you know, that, because you guys have really started something that, you know, I, I really do appreciate it. But one thing is, why didn't you include the poverty and the domestic violence of, of women in the U.S.? Because, you know, three women die of domestic violence, like, every day here, here. And 
you know, they're raped and beaten and people stalk them and, you know, they're, they're, they're targeted. They're, they're targeted like, like the Amish girls, you know, like even serial killings, like the 13 young ladies in New Mexico. And I know there's, there's problems abroad and, and I commend you for putting the spotlight on that, but it's problems here too. Terrific. You know. the, the, the domestic context? No, there really are problems here, and you know I totally think that they should be solved as well. Um, you know, I, you know I think we can do it, we can do more too. I think we do do it all. I mean, it, with uh, you know in Britain as well. I mean, they fought the slave trade that was going to the New World. They had problems at home too, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't also tackle the problems abroad. And in many ways, uh, the problems in some of the developing countries that. Jeremy and Aparita are, are working in, they, if you see them up front, um, they are many times, I mean, a degree uh, more severe uh, in many circumstances. And they'll just break your heart. I mean, just, you know, uh, when you see a 13-year-old uh, girl with her eyes gouged out, I mean, just, they're just heartbreaking. Uh, so, you know, there are problems here, and I think we should solve them. Um, there are just terrible problems abroad, too. Okay. Right. Lady right here, in, Brian, right here in the middle. And just a reminder, if you could let us know who you are, too, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Ifsara Mahari. Um, my question is, for example, in India, um, I've read the book in its entirety, and it was an amazing book. Are you quick? It's, uh, very <laughs> moving. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, how do you start moving towards a cultural shift? Like in India, for example, there's such a caste system. How do you start changing that within the society? Like the story with, I think her name was Orsha, like the girl who was educated. She, like hers is one story, but how do you get that to be like inf infective within the region? Hmm. Scaling up for the Washingtonese, right? I mean, I think education, um, well actually that, maybe that's also a chance to just make the point because when, when one talks about the range of issues we've been talking about, sex trafficking, maternal mortality, all these others, then there's a tendency to think that the villains are men, that you know, men are jerks, basically. And I see some people nodding. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's so much more complicated than that. And one of the things that struck us uh, in our reporting was um, that so many of the brothel owners are women. So many of the sex traffickers are women. In India, girls age one to five are 50% more likely to die than boys that age. And one of the reasons is that mothers are only half as likely to take their daughters to be vaccinated as to take their sons. Um, it's mothers who typically cut their daughters' gen or have their daughters' genitals cut, not, not the fathers. I mean, it's uh, even in, in, um, in Eastern Congo, for example, a surprising number of the, of the gang rapes involve women soldiers who recruit, bring girls in, hold them down, this kind of thing. It's, it's, the problem is often very patriarchal attitudes, but ones that are absorbed and transmitted by women as well as men. And how does one change those attitudes? As you say, that's the challenge. And I think education is the single best solvent of them. Um, it goes to everything from birth rates, to earning power, uh, to the way money is spent, who controls the purse strings. Um, but I also think we need to think in creative ways. And I don't know if Aparajita has any thoughts about this, but there was a really interesting study, which we allude to in the book, which came across right as we were ending our research, that was based on um, uh, what happens when television comes to a village in India. And it was a quite good controlled experiment based on surveys before and after. And it found that in terms of whether a woman should be able to leave the house without asking a man's permission, uh, whether wife beating is appropriate, uh, um, and a couple of other things, that, that the arrival of television was equivalent, it found, I think, of five years of education. It had an astonishing effect. Because what happened was you had very isolated villages where everybody had done the same thing forever. And then all of a sudden, they watched television, and there were a lot of kind of middle class families where women only had, you know, maybe two children and was leaving and coming freely and was regarded with a certain amount of autonomy. And it was the first time people in these villages had seen that. 
And, uh, and there was a somewhat similar study in, in Brazil about the imp what happens when television reaches a village and its impact on fertility levels. And so, uh, just you know, there are a lot of things going, a lot of ways to approach this, a lot of uh, a lot of inputs that can have an impact. And I don't know whether that made sense to you, uh, you know, on the ground in yeah. India. I just wanted to reinforce uh, the fact that the cultural barriers are the toughest to break through. You may provide services, you may educate girls, but breaking beliefs and traditions, like for instance in, in India, sun preference. You know, Delhi is the capital of the country. The area where the richest people live in the capital city has the lowest male-female sex ratio. Explain that to me. You know, these are educated, very, very rich people. They would still prefer if, if the first uh, you know, baby is a girl, they will keep aborting the fetus till the wife conceives a son because they want a son. You know, so it's, it's really tough and I agree with you, uh, Nick, that having very good behavior change campaigns, which are very well researched, you really have to get to the root of what's stopping a family from, let's say, not feeding a pregnant woman, expecting her to eat last not allowing her to go to a skilled uh, birth attendant, but making her go to the traditional birth attendant. What are the barriers? And these interventions will have to be localized. You have to understand the local cultural factors, really research it, and then design your behavior change campaigns and advocacy campaigns around it. Okay, that's the gentleman here, and then we'll come down to the front row next there. My name is Khazar Hussein. I work at the intersection of faith and health, and I know that in a, in a lot of societies, Sub-Saharan sub Africa or in South Asia, faith leaders hold a lot of trust. Now, they can be part of the solution or part of the problem. Um, I want to know, um, in your research, how have they been engaged? Uh, yeah, Jeremy? Yeah, I am lucky to share some experience of working with faith-based organization on uh, maternal and newborn health. Where we, we in, this is in Rwanda with uh, one of our program, uh, Kepaigo. Uh, we, we gather all faith-based organization in Rwanda, including Christian, all denomination, plus Muslim, to work on uh, a technical message for women and family, but linked with uh, the verse of the Quran and Bible. And uh, this was the, the first time in Rwanda to have Muslim Christian together to talk about uh, women and child health. And finally, we have a guide that they can use for seven and for, for Quran and, uh, and, and for, from Quran and uh, from the Bible. In addition to that, we, we ask them specially to allow the women to take the leadership to be teach on, on, on the use of the guideline. And this kind of thing is a, a good, good example of how we can involve faith based organizations. Because when we talk about family planning at the same Bible and at the Quran, you will see that God allowed people to have the, the number of uh, children they want. But there is some verses that say that you are responsible for the well-being of the family. It means what? It means that you cannot have more than you can really feed. So this kind of message help women and men and women to have the good understanding of uh, what the, the, the Bible or, and the Quran are doing. So in many programs, I can tell you, even uh, the membership of the White Women Alliance, we have many faith-based organizations. We are not excluding anyone, and they are playing a very good role, and I can ensure you that uh, they have a very good impact. Where you can't find a single health center, you will find a small mosque or church where people are praying their God. Mm -hmm. So working with faith-based organizations is a good experience, and they have a good impact. Mm -hmm. the, the humanitarian community, I think, always tends to emphasize that success is. 
And partly that's because every NGO wants to point to the things that it's done well at so that it's going to get more funding. And in fact, of course, you tend to learn more from your mistakes than from your successes. And so in Half the Sky, we tried to look at some large failures. And one of those that relates to what you're talking about has to do with FGM. Beginning really in the 1970s, there was a global effort to uh, crack down on female circumcision, including rebranding it as female genital mutilation, uh, passing laws in many countries. Um, there were, I don't know how many conferences have been held uh, to discuss FGM. Um, in Guinea, where I was earlier this year, uh, it is now punishable either by life imprisonment or by execution to cut your daughter. And 99 point some percent of girls in Guinea are still cut. Um, all these efforts since the 1970s had negligible impact. Meantime, at the same time, there have been some remarkable successes at the grassroots by local groups working with the local faith community, for example. Um, that, and one of the best known is Tostan in Senegal um, that involve education, local buy-in, local decision making, not, not a bunch of outsiders coming in with a megaphone telling everybody what to do. And these have been uh, really remarkably successful. And I think that there's a lot that we in general should learn uh, from that failure and from these other successes that have gone on largely without outside support. Okay. Yeah, so Hi, I'm Joan Rigdon for Forbes Woman. Uh, read your book and loved it. Thanks very much for all the work that went into it. Um, when did NGOs start embracing the idea that you can raise up a nation by raising up the status of its girls and its women? And how widely embraced is that idea now? And uh, just uh, to throw one more in, how has that strategy evolved uh, in, over, say, the last decade? What you've seen in your, what have you seen out there? It was kind of in the in the 1980s. This really began to become late. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was Larry Summers, believe it or not. You know, invoking his name in Washington <laughs> has uh, many ramifications. But in this specific area, uh, in the early 90s, he wrote something when he was at the World Bank, the chief economist at the World Bank, saying that the best investment return on your investment investment is to invest in girls and women uh, because the payback is so big. And I think that you know, over the, the ensuing years, um, uh, researchers have found that you do get the biggest bang uh, when you uh, invest in education of women, of girls, and also when you, as a micro lender, invest in women. Uh, they tend to pay back their loans uh, more so than uh, men in the same environment. Uh, and they also, I mean, I hate to say this, but you know, they also, you know, have better businesses. I mean, they sort of have better run businesses with better um, spending decisions uh, in their businesses. That's what the see research who controls has the checkbook in our family. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's some other questions. There's one right back there. Yeah, sorry, in the orange or pink. Try not to just call. Hi, my name is Anita Sakurai, and I work with Counterpart International. And thank you so much for bringing this information to the mainstream public, really. This is probably stuff we've all been working on for years. And it's, um, I'm very curious what's been the reaction by the general public, and do you see movement and awareness raising, and is it going to make our jobs easier? <laughs> Well, the book has only come out today. <laughs> today is the publication date. So, um, but we're very encouraged um, uh, by people who have been ex who've now become interested in the in the subject. So, I do hope that you know, in terms of your working on the cause, that um, more people will join you. We, we started a website, uh, halfthesky.movement.org, that lists various organizations that are you know active in this terrain. And you know, Cheryl and I are the messengers, we're carrying the, the flashlight, but ideally we will then shine some kind of a light that will get 
readers then to really engage in these organizations. And one of the messages, I mean, we, I, I mean it'd be nice if people wrote checks, but we also really would love to see more young people especially go and travel and spend some time out in the grassroots learning these things. And go work with a Paradito or Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you have one of the best contests. I, I wish I were still a student to apply <laughs> for your accompany you on some of these trips because it sounds like uh, how, is that inspiring others to try to uh, have some of these same piggybacking um, programs um, this is uh, many of you know who follow Nick that he has contests where you kind of make a pitch as a student to come along uh, on some of his trips and do reporting with him and and see some of these uh, same you know they're not easy trips but no, they're the, tremendous the, trips the, the joke at the New York Times is that first prize is uh, one trip with me uh, Second prize is two trips with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I do think, uh, you know, particularly for the perhaps uh, innovation for some of the funders in the room, finding some systematic funding for that kind of, you know, it's yeah. almost, it, it's, it is a mentoring program and such, but it, 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 it must have tremendous I oh, impact on those individuals, but also the, to bring the stories I mean, out. it's transformative, and that's generally true, I think, of aid efforts. I mean, if you... So often, in so many of the cases we write about, you talk about you know, somebody in this country who kind of reluctantly, philanthropically got engaged in some issue and thought it was going to be a sacrifice and a burden. And the truth is that our efforts to help other people have a somewhat mixed record, but they have an almost perfect record of helping ourselves. Mm -hmm. And they, and you know, there's so many, uh, I mean, if the, if the Peace Corps even, I mean, I think the Peace Corps would say that. Uh, you know, they genuinely do good work and make a difference and help other communities, but they utterly transform the people who go out on Peace Corps. And so I think that we would be a better country and we would have better policies if we could figure out more ways of getting our young people to spend time um, embedded in a foreign country. And, uh, you know, American universities have they offer great education in many ways, but this kind of international education, especially escaping the bubble. I mean, if you go with a herd of other students to Florence for a semester, that's, that's, you know, that's not a real Investigating why, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. um, I saw there's a hand right below the lights back there. I um, want to make sure we don't just see the, get the people in the front, get the folks in the back, an opportunity. Vilkadinev, I, I just wanted to suggest that um, your stories are very compelling and they are very informative to the general public in the U.S., but I would put some figures um, with those stories. People in the U.S. think that 15% of the gross national product goes into international development, and we all know that it's only 0, 0 0.0 something. So that kind of, of um, comparison would be very compelling for more people to be supportive of international programs. If they would know how much goes into arms and into weapons and how much goes into fighting against maternal uh, mortality, that, that would be a very compelling story, especially if it comes from you and you have a big, big audience. Back to that story to report. And, Page 3326. <laughs> no, we do talk about it. <laughs> we do mention that, yeah. yeah. But thank you for that. It's very true. Okay. There's a Brian right here. There are a couple clustered in the middle. We can catch those. My colleagues are getting a workout here in the size of this room. Right there on the left. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Luzon Paul, and I actually work for Toast On. And um, we have a, an issue that we face ourselves in that you were mentioning before the amount of money that goes into marketing for toothpaste. But on this side of nonprofit work, um, if you put money into marketing or into overhead, your charity navigator star rating right. goes down. Right. Or you get punished in ways where the mass audience or the general public will donate to you based on the number of stars you have on your website rather, on, rather than on your productivity or success. So since a great book like Half the Sky doesn't come out for us every single day, um, <laughs> it would be great to know other ways or other suggestions to get our name and our message out that doesn't cause our overhead to continue to go up. 
Which, can I piggyback on that too and, and kind of ask you what your plans are for the book in terms of whom you're talking with, what kinds of audiences, and what's your strategy for um, how, how, I mean, there's a, there's a stereotype of the book tour, but I, I don't see the two of you as being fairly stereotypical, so. I'll answer the narrow okay. Chris standpoint, and Cheryl <laughs> is the guru of this broader well, that uh, way, but then, effort. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, you, you're absolutely right that there is this big problem that everybody is so concerned, I mean, the, so concerned with administrative expenses that they shortchange expenses which really are important in administration. And I mean, it's always kind of amusing that NGOs have figured out that if they send a fundraising appeal, then be sure to have a paragraph or two about some kind of policy so that they can check that off as, as advocacy spending <laughs> rather than as fundraising uh, spending. And, um, you know, so much uh, people don't have, they don't want to spend money on computer systems that would make them their work more efficient because then that adds to their administrative expense. And there's a real, um, there's a real problem here. Um, I don't know quite how we get around it because obviously it's harder to gauge the, you know, the real bang for the buck. And one of the few metrics you can use is administrative expense. We, we, we exaggerate that. Um, but um, I, I think we need to think more creatively, but I don't have any, any great solution uh, other than to, I guess um, bring toothpaste marketers <laughs> into, into your board as, as volunteers. Well, one of the things that half the half the sky movement dot org does is actually it does help publicize a lot of the uh, uh, NGOs, um, and you know there's a team of people who have tried to raise money on behalf of the NGOs to help the NGOs, to, uh, you know, capitalize on any kind of you know publicity or marketing around you know this entire effort. Uh, so there's that, um, but also one of the things that you know we've been focusing on when we talk to people about uh, you know whether or not you know this organization has you know spends 15 percent on administration or 20 percent. Um, well, first of all, we aren't looking at the success of an organization in terms of those metrics. Um, I think that organizations that work in developing world really. Um, have to, there has to be another dimension of analysis, and that is that they are, if they are producing outcomes that are nowhere else uh, in this industry, then it doesn't matter how much they spend on administration because you are getting that or you're getting nothing. You're getting zero solutions to those problems. So outcomes far outweigh the traditional metrics uh, on NGOs. So I think the focus on outcomes is key in the developing world because it's a, it, you know, in the developing world, it's just a different game from, you know, NGOs that are focused only on, uh, you know, on the cities here, on the states, or, you know, on national problems. I don't know if that helps. I, I'd just like to add to that, you know, you talk about advertising and the cost of advertising. When the White Women Alliance started its work in 1999, the first goal that was set was to raise awareness. Because what really hit us was that a woman dies every one minute, but people don't know about it. Jeremy referred to it once, you know, whether it's on a time, at a time when we're speaking to women CEOs, this utter disbelief on their face when we tell them the stories or tell them the numbers. So what has been very successfully done is really use some very committed champions, personalities, film stars, pop stars. In India, we use a very young rocker who takes five minutes off in a rock concert and talks about maternal health in the country. We use a film star who's also a member of parliament. It would make an effort to reach out to these people. I wouldn't like to call it free publicity, but it's really amplifying the voices uh, without getting into a toothpaste ad campaign <laughs> mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brian, right back down here in the middle. There's one there and then one there. Thank you. Is this on? Yep. Um, I'm Sharon Fon. I live and work in South Africa, and I'm a, a, a fellow at the... Uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. I just wanted to amplify the point is when you, that my colleague at the back has made about aid and aid money, um, something I'm sure you know, but the net flow of aid, of money movement between the developed world and Africa, for example, is to the developed world in terms of debt repayment. Um, and so the sense that we are helping them 
um, is naive and incorrect. Um, and that the, as you invited us to make a comment on USAID, for example, the conditionality on those grants are um, profound. Uh, and for example, the demand that you buy American or fly American, um, which sometimes incurs ridiculous costs and undermines what in theory that aid's supposed to be doing, which is promoting development within those countries. Um, and these are unusual contradictions that people don't have the confidence often to say because you're dependent on getting that money. And so there's some really perverse um, incentives and disincentives which actually don't help. I haven't read your book, I'm sorry, I've just seen it. But I have paged through quite a bit of it and, and looked at the bibliography, well, the list of things that you can look at. And there are a lot of international organizations um, but the point is, and I think it's a point that you've been making, that it's local um, organizations, and you can't find them in the bibliography, they're tiny, it's impossible to reference all of them. Um, Tostan maybe stands out as, as one example where you have, and clearly there are more, I'm sure, in your book, I haven't seen it. But it's the big international organizations who, quite frankly, have become corporatized, and they themselves don't necessarily um, promote local people doing local work in local environments. And that is essential, I think, to countries helping themselves. Um, and so it's just a point I wanted to bring. We're starting to get closer to the time, so perhaps we'll capture a couple and then give you all sure. opportunity. Right across the way, yeah, and then we have one in the back over there. Hi, um, I'm with Results. Um, and we're here in DC um, as a member of the US chapter of the Glo Global Campaign for Education. And um, Mr. Kristoff and um, Ms. Wu Dun, in your article um, you published on the 23rd of August, you talked about um, encouraging Obama to uh, support global education for girls starting with $10 million. Um, billion. Ten, $10 billion, sorry, over the next five years. Um, and Obama and Clinton have both expressed their support for a global fund for education, capitalized with $2 billion, which would motivate um, international political will and mobilize resources to achieve education for all. Um, would you come out in support of the US spearheading a multilateral funding mechanism for education, kind of like the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria? OK, I'll let you think about that one. There was the best. <laughs> Over here. Uh, sorry, but we just need to collect a number of them before we have to end. Uh, to what extent uh, do you think that race is sometimes a factor in um, the, the time and the, the, fin the finances and the devotion to aid or assistance uh, to African women is, for example, as just always uh, something that uh, I've been curious about, is there a racial factor? if you just want to be honest about it, to the time and resources that people devote okay. to, to help with the problem. Okay, and there was one other that was right in that area, just while Kaylee, no, maybe we got a district. Okay, there's one in the back, Brian. I'll give you a chance to respond. Thank you. You'd have to be yes from the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. Um, Nick, you had me right, right at the beginning when you mentioned social psychology and what makes our communications more effective. <laughs> You've had me years ago, and Cheryl, I'm not a threat, obviously, but um, I would love to ask you to focus a little bit more and speak more to the, what I think is the underlying principle of what Aparajita has made your behavior change campaigns in India successful, and what is successful in, in the outcome focus that you are talking about, Cheryl, it is it's the emotional connection, and it seems the emotional commitment that you're building by getting one of your beautiful students to go with you. And I think you, you, you have so many uh, stories to the principle of focusing on emotions rather than on facts and figures, even though they're absolutely important too. But would you mind expanding on that for us so that we become more effective in <coughs> enrolling the people that we need to enroll? Thank you. Should we start with that one? On that front, um, there, I think, is pretty persuasive research in social psychology that, indeed, um, the way our, our brains function, and this actually, when you, light, when, you, when you see 
you know, maps of, of, of the brain, uh, a neurology, you can really see that it's the, the parts that govern emotions that first um, uh, decide any kind of moral issue, and then the rational parts come in to find reasons to support it. But if you want to, um, so if you want to make a, an argument on some kind of moral issue, Jonathan Hyde at University of Virginia has done some good work on this, um, then you, know, you start by building that emotional connection, and then in turn, the brain will find some, some reasons to support it. And conversely, there's uh, been some work, I don't think Paul Slovic actually did the research, but he, he wrote about it, uh, Professor Paul Slovic, uh, that if you ask, the, if you prep people uh, by asking them to do some math problems, and then you solicit their support for a moral cause, then you're less likely to, to give than if they haven't done those math problems. That exercising the more rational parts of the brain discourages this kind of bond and this kind of, of empathy. And um, I, I, you know, we're, we're groping to kind of what all this means and what the implications are, but I think we have to do a lot more groping. And I think the humanitarian world has felt itself exempt because these issues are important. And in fact, it's because the issues are important that we have to try all that much harder. But, you know, um, in, in the corporate world, uh, salespeople are taught to sell with the right side of the brain, which is the emotions, and not with the left side of the brain, which is all those calculations. So, I mean, just even in the corporate world, you know, it's, it's really propagated that, you know, you have to build a connection, an emotional mm -hmm. connection with your client. And the same, you know, can be true uh, in the nonprofit world. I mean, think, you know, sort of move with the right side of your brain. Uh, and, you know, you sort of, the way I remember it is that, you know, if you're, uh, you know, a map of the U.S. and you're, uh, you know, you're facing out of the U.S., the right side of the brain is where California, where Hollywood is, where all sort of the, <laughs> the, you know, the, the drama and the, and the emotion is. Uh, the left side is where New York is the world of finance. <laughs> so um, think with, just move with the right side of your brain and I just think that that's, you know, that's an established moray in, in the corporate world and it's worked for so many years. One of you like to address the question of uh, conditionality and flows and, and local versus international um, NGOs and efforts? I, you know, I, I think that when we talk of issues which are so difficult to resolve, whether it's girls' education or it's women's health, you know, there should be less of us and they. I think we all should look at ways of how everyone can do what they're best at. You know, in countries like ours, it's usually NGOs versus government. They don't talk to each other, you know. Donors may put all their money into the government kitties. And NGOs do not get any part of the fund, so how are NGOs supposed to operate? I, you know, global funding works in a different way, but I, th I personally think it's really, really important that we move the priorities to the national arena. We can mobilize resources at the global level, but it should be really left to the countries, not just governments, but even civil society in the countries, to decide where to invest, how to invest, and how best to get the results. I think that's really the way forward. Uh, problems are localized. Uh, solutions also should be localized. And I think it's uh, sometimes, you know, whether it's what we were discussing, HIV against reproductive health, or it's, you know, international NGOs against local NGOs, government against NGOs. I think, you know, it's an age of globalization where we should just step beyond all that. It's easier said than said than done. I understand that. But I think that's the, you know, way to go forward. Okay. I think we, we have the same discussion in the country where I come from, in Rwanda. This is uh, because of one message we received from, I think, from here, talking about transition, capacity building, local capacity building. And we say if, if we have to really understand the message, it means we have to, to do both. To even cut cut the head if they want to do everything locally, because we are saying that the local leadership doesn't mean skilled on some area. In that health area, I have to to say that we don't have all the solutions at local here. We need 
the advanced technology mm -hmm. from, from the developed country. This is something that we cannot deny. We, we, we already saw in many countries where we put the money for the local uh, NGOs, etc. but they haven't been able to deliver a, a quality of services. So at the beginning, I think we need, we need the external aid. But this, is, this aid have to build to stop the aid in the long term, not to, to, to say, okay, now we are going to give you independence. I, I used to compare this kind of thing like independence in Africa. We say, okay, we want independence. They, they say, okay, you have now independence, but what have been have we been able to do? After that, there was coup d'etat, coup d'etat, and nothing. For the training of provider, if we have to, to, to train someone to be able to do C-section, it's not something that we have to adapt to the local condition. It's an international standard that have to be applied. Mm -hmm. What we receive internationally in US, the women in the, 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 the remote village at uh, at Rwanda need the same thing. And at this level, we need, we need the collaboration. But how can we build a long-term assistance to the country that we support? Is really to use this resource to build the capacity for the long term. I don't want to put a, to interrupt the link and saying that we don't need international NGO in our country. And after that, uh, we are not sure. The second level is not uh, between uh, local NGO and international one. It's also including the government. Many governments are requesting to have the common basket. It means if you want to, to, to support any country, you give money directly to the country and the country decide what to do. But sometimes we realize that the money don't go where it should go or they don't have the skill to do and you don't have the, the, the way to control anything. So. I agree that we need to implement, to analyze together, to decide what we want together, to not impose one intervention that they don't want, but at least we need to be, to have the same way to analyze things based on the standard that are international. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeremy, I, that, that's a very eloquent statement and a good, I think, place that, that for us to end in terms of striking a balance and understanding both the connections and the interdependencies and how we can obviously help one another, uh, but we have to do it with our eyes open and in full collaboration. Um, this has been a very rich discussion and it's a very rich volume that you've given us. Thank you, um, thank you all for some excellent questions. Please join me in thanking our guests. <laughs>